shelters peace in parting no release. When she sang your food, Pingo Fu Sanha. Towards the end of the Second World War, the state the East was in, the Japanese army plainly saw they probably could not win. So after 1944, in a small place called Harbin, a camp was sighted in Pingfang, where in seven months of shame and sin, on 3,000 mainly Chinese peasants there, experiments would begin. By the banks of the Songhua River they waited The youth corps of the Simmons Liwan They had order sight sealed and dated All the deeds that would be done Kawasaki their sergeant looked and hated Was a little man with a big gun A secret squadron specially created their training had begun With a few harsh words and a threat or two Discipline was soon maintained Ishikawa was sixteen, part of the crew Each one a murderer thus ordained Every man given orders grimly knew Each victim would be slain Whether Russian Han or Manchu, only corpses would remain. On February the 29th, in swirling snow in the dead of night, battered and bruised, the people stood. They held each other and shivered in fright. Escape was unlikely, salvation was less. Faith was slender and hope was slight. They were now prisoners, bought and sold, the frail and the poor, the young and the old. Property of the Japanese army, no one to witness their pitiful plight. The frantic effort of one young mother, her baby's cry she tried to smother. But Kawasaki heard the sound, his men, they grinned at one another. The woman pleaded pitifully, but he grabbed the child from her embrace. Then he dashed it to the ground, shoveling snow upon his face. Zhao Qing was three months old, and now his sightless eyes staring to space. On March the 9th was Zhao Hui Chu still grieving over her baby's murder, taken by force to a wooden enclosure, yelling for mercy but nobody heard her. Both arms tied for 17 hours, freezing cold water poured over her pain, the ice then smashed it, fell in showers, the process repeated again and again. She was taken away at the end of the day, her body turned blue by the ice of the rain. Lieutenant General Ishii surveyed the fear and suspicion his troops displayed. The Japanese youngsters clearly saw their dreaded commander pick up a blade. Xiao Hui Chu was 24, no longer a mother, a widow maid. He cut an incision on each of her arms, then he peeled away her flesh. Her bones and sinews thus revealed the experiment was a success. Jin Yuan Lung in his 31 years had never seen such a sight before. Hardly could he restrain his tears at Ishii's pleasure in what he saw. But Yuan was roughly led by the guards to a couple of holes drilled in a door. A blast of liquid nitrogen caressed his flesh from fingers to shoulders. Taken out and hit with a hammer, his arms were smashed into tiny boulders. On April 11, 15 men and 15 women were taken outside, kicked, shoved and brutalized, all to wooden crosses were tied. Lieutenant General Shiro Ishii issued the order suffused with pride as fragmentation bombs erupted and 30 people horribly died. Inspecting the carnage of severed limbs, Ishii was duly satisfied. However, 
with only 30 dead, the results were inconclusive. Another 58 people were led and subjected to further abuses. So on May 22, with much ado, 29 women on crosses were tied together with 29 men. It's true their demise was less than dignified. With the fuses wired, the bombs were fired and 58 people painfully died. Amid such crime there came a time when the people were moved to rebel. And so on the morning of May 29 the prisoners rattled their cell. Kawasaki awoke the machine gun crew as he rang the emergency bell. The Chinese led by Chu Hua resolved to send their tormentors to hell. But as bullets were spent, down they went and 35 prisoners died where they fell. Natasha Ivanova cried to the brink of insanity To the Japanese in vain she tried to appeal to their basic humanity Eleven years old was Tanya her daughter Who plainly was hardly prepared for the slaughter Sealed in a room full of poison gas Together they suffered in silence Mother and daughter both suffocated Two further victims of violence on July the 2nd, the youth brigade were gathered together with men in white. No doubt they were afraid to see yet another inhuman sight. As into a fortified metal room, a nameless Chinese man was led. The air released, the pressure decreased, the man from every orifice bled. Every youth was made to witness the agony painted across his head. With no remorse and further force, the captain increased the power. In total disdain for his pain, the torture continued for half an hour. Nakagawa was ill, and yet he still stood transfixed and had to stare at the bloated flesh and the mangled mess in which they all had to share. When from his arse intestines passed, the test was finally over at last.
officer stood expressions of wood and waited for Ishii to enter the room. As he drew back his hand it was carefully planned and he hurled a pot at a wall. The porcelain shattered in pieces they scattered and laughing applauded it all. Their glorious leader would never concede a defeat, his pride was never to fall. So on August the 8th they assembled to wait as 36 men were tied up as before. The porcelain bomb would decide their fate. This was the way they'd win the war. Feeling inspired the bombs were fired but suddenly panic ensued. The officers gaped, the men had escaped and frantically they were pursued. But during the battle like so many cattle with slaughter they soon were subdued. 35 bodies were carried away, the Japanese soldiers had little to say. Somebody spoke and shared a joke to hide the shame of the day. Unbeknown to those in charge, a Chinese youth of 18 years was hidden and still remained at large to tell the truth of the blood and the tears. So ashamed were a couple of Japanese at the behavior of their peers. By August the 12th, perseverance and stealth brought the end of the war into sight. The Chinese battalions, like stampeding stallions, set every Japanese border alight. The Australian forces, a herd of wild horses, put all the Nippinese soldiers to flight. A salvo by Britain, the Emperor smitten, the rising sun was no longer so bright. If she heard the news, Japan would lose, yet still he wished to continue the fight. The camp was in panic as Ishii decreed all documents to be destroyed. Takamura continued in vain to plead an action he wished to avoid. Flames were turned as papers burned, the camp consumed by fire. The prisoners massed, all were gassed, their bodies flung into the mire. From that pit a giant accusing finger of smoke rose ever higher. On August 15, their conscience is clean, the Japanese left in torrential rain. There was no grief, but only a relief, they'd never return to the camp again. A Japanese woman went into labor, about to give birth to a baby that day. She told a Chinese lad of 18, awaited the train to take him away. The sound of her scream broke into his dream, awoke and he commented on the delay. Kawasaki stood up at the sound of the voice. He noticed the boy hidden under a sheet. To sound the alert or stay silent, the choice was easy and decency could not compete. She tore through caution no way to the wind as he struck the sergeant a blow to the head. And then another, and then another, until Kawasaki was finally dead. The Japanese woman became a mother, a corpse for her baby's bed. At a Japanese captain's indignation, she all turned and spat defiance in an act of desperation. Courage and folly formed an alliance. He ran at the officer, ready to kill, shouting death, his fists raised. Through the air, a flagpole sailed. Everyone stared, shocked, amazed. On a Japanese flag, the lad was impaled. Through sightless eyes, the boy now gazed. She shank for young. Trains rolled up on wheels of steel, all with silent drivers. There was no high court of appeal, no breathless late arrivers. Of all the victims in that camp, there were no survivors.